Welcome to High Life. My guest today is Wayne hampson Pot, Associate Director at the Private Office of Christie's Real Estate Dubai. Hi, Wayne. Hi, Nicolette. Thank you for inviting me in. Thank you for being here. So, Wayne, tell me about your background and your journey to joining Christie's. Um, I suppose it all started in 2005. I originally trained as a surveyor and then later as a chartered wealth manager. And I took a role here back in 2005 and worked in financial management and wealth management until well, for about 10 years. Mm. And at the end of that journey, I started getting more and more involved in the advisory of second citizenship or alternative citizenship by investment for some of my high net worth clients. And the qualifying vehicle for that was investing in real estate. So almost by accident, I became a broker as I helped clients buy properties in Cyprus, in Malta and, um, and Switzerland, etc. I was very lucky enough to be offered a role at the private office at Christie's and I, and I jumped at that. Mm -hmm. And um, because I think it's, it's the brand that really attracts um, clients and also because we have this huge global network of affiliates and offices, that we can have access to some of the best, most coveted real estate in the world. So, yeah, no, delighted to be on board at Christie's. Yeah, we really do have access to the best properties we around do. the world. Yeah. So to those who don't know, tell us a little bit about what the private office at Christie's means. So the private office is being designed to bring together expertise globally through single points of contact for some of the world's wealthiest families, or most private families. Now, if you're a person of significant wealth, you are usually quite secretive, and your confidentiality is very important. You don't give your telephone number out to everyone. You don't want everybody knowing your business. So having one trusted source that is a focal point for all the expertise around the world that Christie's can bring in is vital to them, and that's what the private office does. And we enable them to buy and sell their real estate assets um, in one country or across border. So they may be buying something in Dubai. They may be selling something in London or Monaco. And we can have one single point work them throughout that journey. So our private office obviously advises on real estate investments, but we also look at the tax implications for our clients. We also look at the state planning, which is also important. Let's talk about that a little bit more because I don't think many people understand or even consider the importance of having a will. So can you tell me a little bit more about why that is so important? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So next generation planning or estate planning or, or simply having a will is vital anywhere in the world and particularly in the Middle East, whether they're you know, just buying their one bedroom apartment or they're buying a Bulgari mansion. This is vitally important. So if you're non-Muslim and you want your asset to go to the people that you want to, it's vital that you have a will. Now, the UAE has now recognized wills of domicile and wills notarized in the country or in your home country here as fact. So no longer do you need to worry about your, your assets being distributed by a Sharia law, which is a forced formula. You can now write a will register it in the DIFC, then your asset will then be distributed to your spouse or your children or whoever you wish to without any probate. Okay, so apart from the wills, what are other key considerations for ultra high net worth investors when it comes to investing in property? So the other considerations that our clients have, ultra high net worth clients have when buying a property that we should take into consideration when providing advice is Obviously, why, why are they buying the asset? Is it a buy to use? Is it, are, they, are they going to be the end occupier? And if that's the case, it becomes quite, um, it's becomes quite exciting because obviously you're involved in buying and sourcing some, some beautiful properties. Um, and location becomes, as for everyone, um, vital. Um, and what I'm finding is that it's beachfront mm. every time. So water is the key thing in Dubai. If they're going to look at an investment, we've got to look at the time they're going to have that investment for. Are they looking simply to buy something off plan and then resell once it's finished or just before it's finished? So we, we need to look at that exit strategy. Um, or is it something that's going to be a buy and hold? I'm going to buy this one, let's say, in Marcel Arab, and I'm going to hold it for the next 10 years because I think that asset will double, triple, quadruple over time. 
So that's what we look at. And then part of the private office is also we've got to be aware of the taxation implications, not just in the UAE, but when they move their money back to their own country, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, if there are any implications of that, do they need to declare anything? So we can advise on all these things. Which nationalities do you see buying mostly in Dubai? And has that been changing recently? Good question. Um, and it changes every year, it seems. So I think in... in Pre-COVID, it, it was what I would call our usual suspects. So it would be um, Indian nationals, British nationals, EU nationals, um, and even US to a certain degree. But what happened then, mainly because, well, I think two things happened. Obviously, COVID happened and the UAE's and Dubai's response to it was amazing. Um, and we saw a great deal of or an influx of people from central, from Europe, from France, et cetera, et cetera, come to Dubai and go, wow, this is a really great place, um, and started investing in. So we saw a lot of people from France coming at that point as well. Um, and that was all, at the same time that taxation increased in France as well for the ultra wealthy. Mm -hmm. So that was no coincidence. Um, we then, in recent times, we had obviously had a, an influx of people from Russia um, buying in country. And that's been going on now for about two, two and a half years. Um, and I think we're coming to a, the, a change in that cycle at the moment. And we may now see an exit. So it's people selling property that they bought two years ago, particularly in the Russian market, um, because they'll be moving on to something else to invest in. They may be upgrading their, their investment in the U UAE, or they may be moving money back out outside. So that, that's something going on. I don't have a crystal ball, but my <laughs> prediction is that we will see um, an influx of investors from the UK um, immediately. Now, they may not be British nationals. In fact, they won't be British nationals. They'll be, they'll be what I call non-DOMs. Mm -hmm. So the Conservative government made some changes to the non-DOM rules recently that is making the UK less friendly, more hostile to non-DOMs or people of significant wealth in country. Now, Labour have also made some announcements on, the, on further hostilities towards non-DOMs. What we're starting to see already and what we anticipate is that there's going to be a lot of non-DOMs currently living in the UK, mainly in London, going, OK, I need to go and find somewhere to spend a significant time. Right. And that's almost certainly going to be Dubai. So which territories or cities have you seen being most popular lately for these ultra high net worth investors other than Dubai? <laughs> I've got to say Dubai is definitely vogue at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, the, the old favourites continue to be, to be there, you know, Monaco, the south of France, um, Switzerland, for, you know, ski destinations for, for winter mm -hmm. activities are still the playgrounds of the rich and famous. Um, We've seen a little bit of movement out of Monaco. Um, there's been some jurisdictional changes there with their residency program. Um, so we've seen a little bit of movement out of that area too. But the old favourites are, you know, are still working very well. But Dubai is very vogue at the moment. It's becoming more sophisticated. There's much more to do than there was 10 years ago. Um, and what we're also seeing is you know, movement from the UK and other places. Now I'd like to know, other than the location itself, what kind of properties, what types of pro properties are these investors mostly interested in these days? Going on my own experience for my clients, it's branded residences tends okay. to be... They're becoming very big thing. Very big thing. Um, and that's because most people of significant wealth, I would say all people of significant wealth, do not have just one home. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they are lucky enough to have two, three, four, five different homes around the, around the world. And because of that, they're not resident full time in a property. So the ability to turn the key, slam the door shut and leave it for three or four months, knowing that it's perfectly looked after. You've got this world class facilities and services all around it, making sure that when you come back, everything is perfect is vitally important. So a big mansion for people who are transient around the world doesn't often work because mm -hmm. obviously they're a hard work to keep up and you need to be on top of it. So apartments, branded residences, branded penthouses, etc., are the kind of space that my clients are looking at mostly. 
So define what a branded residence is then, as opposed to a mansion or any other kind of apartment. So a branded residence in its simplest form is a collaboration between a developer and a hotel brand or a standalone brand, like a fashion brand. And they will come together to, and are promised to deliver a certain quality of service to those clients. Now, there are, in principle, around three stroke four different types of them. The, the most obvious one and the original branded residence concept is, is, was the condo hotel. And that's where you have a hotel and a branded residence in the same building. Now, a good example of that and a recent example of that would be the Royal Atlantis or Atlantis Royal um, here in Dubai, where you've got this amazing hotel and branded residences in the same property. And obviously the clients of the branded, Robinses, branded residences sorry, um, have the, all the facilities of the hotel and it's amazing. So that's one type. The other type would be what we call co-located. Now, a co-located branded residence, one would be the, the Bulgari Resort on Jumeirah Bay Island. So you've got the, the fantastic Bulgari Hotel. And then adjacent to it, you've got six branded residences, an array of private mansions and seven ocean mansions, um, all branded Bulgari. And you've got the brand new lighthouse, lighthouse being built as well at the mm. moment. Now, all of those have all the service levels that you'd expect of staying at the Bulgari Hotel itself. Um, and the obviously amazing architecture as well, which is what attracts clients to it as well. So that's the, that's the co-located. And then you have standalones. Standalone brand residences are where you have um, the Four Seasons is a good example of this. You'll have the Four Seasons Hotel, um, which is just a hotel. But elsewhere in the city, you will have a Four Seasons private residence, say on the canal or the new one launched in DIFC. Now, they aren't part of the hotel, but they have the hotel nearby. And again, so that's the type of hotel branded residences types we have. So we have three of those. And the fourth and final one is what we call um, badged independent brands. So they'll be non-hotel brands. So they don't have a hotel offering, but they have a very strong brand identity. And examples of that could be Bentley, Porsche, um, Jacob & Co., et cetera, et cetera. In your opinion, you've mentioned many that have already been built or are currently being being built. Uh, what will be the next big branded residence? Um, the pipeline for Dubai is very exciting. Mm -hmm. So we've got um, at least four or five major brands coming in. So we've got one of the most exciting ones is the um, Amman Hotel and Residences. The location has been sorted out. Mm -hmm. um, the developer has been sorted out. Um, and we're eagerly awaiting the, the launch. And the Carlisle Hotel from Manhattan, part of Rosewood, um, is also going to be opening a hotel and residences, um, again, in DIFC. So DIFC is very exciting at the moment. But so outside of Dubai, I'd also like to know, are there any that stand out to you? There are obviously many. Um, one of my favourite projects is the Whiteley in London, in Paddington. What they've managed to do with the Whiteley is um, combine some of the fantastic architecture that was already there, bring it up to date. Um, Six Senses have got the hotel and spa there. And it's a it's a smashing project. So that's one of my favorites at the moment. Yeah, it's not necessarily an an obvious location that you would think to put a branded residence into no, Paddington. Exactly. It's completely restructured the entire area. Yeah, no, it's exciting. One of the other locations or brands that stands out to me at the moment that's of great interest, and it's a passion of mine, is the Mandarin Oriental. So the Mandarin Oriental have um, delivered some beautiful hotels and residences around the world. Um, and the new one in Miami is immense. Um, and I think this is a very exciting project and we're proud at Christie's to be very much involved with that. Um, so what Mandarin Oriental have, have done both in London, in Barcelona and now in Miami is next level. So there's really a lot of interest is. from our clients yeah. on that at the moment. Okay, before we move on, is there anything else that you think is important to mention about branded residences? Something that people may not consider before they look at branded residences? Yeah, I think there's a couple of points which I think people forget to look at initially. And that's the fine print. So with all things, <laughs> the detail is important. Yeah. So 
what are you, there, there are three considerations. I think. Firstly, um, if you're buying a branded residence, what are you buying? Uh, if you're buying just a badge, then be aware that you're just buying a badge and make sure your service charge reflects that. So service charges can range from, in Dubai instances, from around 25 dirhams per square foot to 150 dirhams per square foot. I assume the latter is for branded residences. For super, super prime <laughs> branded residences, yeah. So this is talking a man level or muscle or rap level, mm-hmm. so you know, the, the very top of the pyramid. Um, so that's fine. So if you're just buying a badge and your pricing is at, at the, the high level, you need to question that. Um, make sure you know what you're getting, what I would say in branded residences. The, and what are extras as well? You may think that you're paying for beach access with this branded residence, but then you find out you've bought a property and then you actually have to buy a beach membership on top of that, mm-hmm. which is not the end of the world compared to what you just spent, but it's also nice to know before you go in what the circumstances are. The other thing to look at is to make sure that your broker or your real estate professional has a look at the agreement between the, the branded residence provider, the developer, and the brand. What is that relationship? Because you want, you, what you want to do is make sure that the architecture that you're buying, the property you're buying, holds its value, should, should say in 10 years or in 20 years' time, the brand relationship ends and you're left with a property that's no longer branded now most branded residency contracts are 20 30 years Mm -hmm. which is fine for for an initial investment but when you're selling in 10 years time in 15 years time it becomes it's a bit like a leasehold it becomes more and more important important as you get to the end of it so just make sure that your broker discusses with you how what are the what is the um, the format of the brand agreement between the developer and the property? Okay, so Wayne, you've worked with many properties and wealthy families and and private offices in your lifetime and throughout your career. So I'd be interested in knowing what are some of the lifestyle or behaviour patterns that you have observed. Some things I can talk about and some kind, some things I can't. Um, but I'm a trusted advisor, hopefully, to many. Um, one of the key attributes, what I would say, is that all my all my, all the families that I, I've been privileged to work with, is that family is important, the most important thing to them. Um, so above all, that's obviously no surprise. Um, but privacy, confidentiality are important to them as well. You know, if you are lucky enough to work with a family of significant wealth, be be transparent, be honest, um, talk to them about. You know any fees that you might be getting for any introductions? They're not. They will expect you to have them, but they like to know about it. Mm. So just be honest and upfront about it. Um, but yeah, on the day-to-day basis, no different from any of us. Um, but they just have through their wealth a lot more choice. Uh, but quality is the most important thing to them. It's not about the shininess or the blinginess of it. It's the quality of the product or the service that they're buying. That's the most important. So you mentioned trust a lot. So how do you get to building that level of trust in these relationships with these individuals? Well, I think that goes back to any relationship, whether it's your personal relationship or relationship with a client um, or or children even, is you just need to be factual. Um, Present options as you see them and let them make the decision, not try and get them to make your decision that you want them to do. Get present the options that are available to them and let them decide. Give honest advice. You can certainly give your opinion, hmm. but don't don't labor it. Um, and it's built over time, like everything. You know, so you can't build trust in a, in a, in a one one day meeting. Sure, you know, it, it happens over times, and what you'll find as time goes on you're let in more and more into that circle. And um, all of a sudden, you are, I wouldn't say a friend, but you're a, definitely a trusted advisor. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for being here, Wayne. My pleasure.